Um, it's the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with the webinar. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sri Rao. I will be the moderator for today's webinar on targeted overlay pavement solutions. This is the first in a series of eight webinars under this topic. Um, next slide, please. Um, just so for, uh, for those one or two people who haven't used Zoom who are on this call, uh, uh, the features are very similar to what you've seen before. Uh, this to ask a question, um, and it's just better that uh, we don't talk over each other, so please mute your microphones. Uh, and if you're gonna ask a question, please type that in the chat pod. I'm gonna monitor the chat pod and you can do so by clicking on the chat function uh, on the bottom of your Zoom screen and we will address the uh, Q, uh, the questions that you have during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, some of the features of Zoom are, it, you can just uh, move your mouse uh, onto the, and click on the participants portion of the ribbon you see on the bottom to uh, look at all the participants who are uh, participating in the webinar. Uh, if you have any reactions, you can uh, click on the reactions button or you can raise your hand also by clicking on the reactions button. Uh, but we'll, we're going to try to just use the chat uh, portion of the uh, webinar rather than um, um, talk. Uh, if you have any technical issues or experience any technical difficulties, um, use the chat function again and direct message Monica Doble, who's the host of the webinar, and she'll try to resolve that. If you have um, any other problems, even getting into um, into this session or something like that, you can also email Monica, email Monica at monica.doble at whereas.inc.com or also eric.shulman at whereas.inc.com and they will try to help you uh, through any troubles that you may have connecting. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you an overview of today's webinar, uh, there's gonna be an introduction to EDC6 Tops and Tim Ashenbrenner from Feral Highway will do that uh, introduction. Uh, there'll be a quick overview of high performance thin overlays. Uh, and then Robert Knight from New Jersey DOT will, uh, will talk about his experience with high performance thin overlay in New Jersey. Uh, following that, we'll do a crack attenuating mixture overview. And Ashwak Mohammed from the Houston district within Texas DOT will uh, uh, talk about her experience with uh, crack attenuating mixtures and uh, thin overlay mixtures, Tom in Houston. And then we'll follow that with a Q and A. Um, so just to get started with the webinar, the first portion of the webinar will be an introduction to everyday six counts targeted overlay payment solutions. Again, as I mentioned, this is the first in a series of eight webinars. Um, and to present that is Tim Ashenbrenner from Federal Highway. He's a senior asphalt engineer uh, on the pavement materials team at Federal Highway Office of Headquarters, uh, head Federal Highway Headquarters Office of Infrastructure. Uh, he's worked and experience focused on asphalt materials and recycled materials and quality assurance for uh, decades now. He joined Federal Highway in 2012 after working with Colorado DOT for 22 years. Uh, he's also the chair of uh, the TRB Committee on Quality Assurance Management, uh, which is a 2022 Blue Ribbon Committee. And, um, and I also wanted to mention he received uh, Federal Highway Administrator's 2019 Award for Superior Achievement and is a lifetime member of the Association of Asphalt Paving Technologies. Tim? Hey, well, thank you, Shri. Um, yeah, for our Everyday Counts program, uh, I'm leading the asphalt side and I'm being assisted by Derek Neener Plant from our Resource Center. And we also include concrete pavements as well. And my coworker, Sam Tyson, he's leading the concrete side and he's being assisted by Bob Conway of the Resource Center. So TOPS, Targeted Overlay Pavement Solutions, was selected for this round of Everyday counts were up to round six. Uh, this started back in uh, 2011 and 2012 with EDC1. You probably might recall warm mix asphalt and safety edge. 
but those have now evolved to Everyday Counts 6. There's seven initiatives of which TOPS is one. And so overlays, targeted overlays were selected, I think, because it's very important to agencies. In fact, over 25% of all state DOT funds go to overlays and it makes a lot of sense because there's so many miles that agencies have to manage. Next slide. Now, we've been doing overlays for a long time. And so when TOPS was selected, uh, we wondered, and many people probably wondered, uh, what's different than a targeted overlay payment solution than a typical overlay? And simply put, we try to say our TOPS overlay really try to match treatments to those high priority, high need locations that might need special benefits that a normal overlay could not provide. Next slide. And like any group of stakeholders that comes together, um, our stakeholders included those from several state DOTs, academia, as well as industry. And our group developed this mission statement. Our TOPS overlays are intended to extend pavement life, increase load carrying capacity, and improve safety. And we want to do this in a cost effective manner. I say cost effective because many of these treatments have higher initial cost, but when you look at the overall life cycle cost analysis of that pavement, uh, our lead states have shown clearly that these treatments are cost effective. Next slide. And the goals uh, within EDC6, uh, which also apply to the other initiatives outside of the targeted overlay payment solutions is to increase the number of participating agencies that demonstrate, which means to do a pilot project, assess, which means to evaluate a series of pilot projects, or institutionalize, which means it becomes part of their standard day-to-day -day practice for the overlay solution that that agency selected. So really we're trying to advance states in terms of the implementation process to get them to use it as a standard. And in doing that, uh, we try to build awareness and expand usage by identifying champions, uh, share information at conferences and workshops. We'll have workshops available on a state-by-state -state basis and also training uh, with such as webinars like we're doing now. Next slide. So on the asphalt side of things, we have eight products. Uh, these eight products are proven uh, because we have several lead states, but oftentimes they are underutilized. There's opportunities for more states to try to advance these. We'll learn about the HEPTO, the high performance thin overlay and the CAM, the crack attenuating mixture today. Uh, future webinars will have uh, some of the others, such as the highly modified asphalt. I should mention the four on the bottom, uh, stone matrix asphalt, asphalt rubber gap graded, open graded friction course, and the ultra thin bonded wearing course. Those are some oldies, but goodies. Those are certainly proven in many states. They're not underutilized, but our stakeholders thought there could be opportunities to expand the use of those in some other states. And we have seen several states select these to move forward with implementation. Next slide. And Concrete uh, has four products. We'll be having the webinars or alternate between asphalt and concrete. And so there'll be four webinars on concrete as part of this series. Next slide. With so many TOPS products that can get overwhelming, how do you select which one might be best for you? So our approach is to think of the highway network you have, what concerns do you have, what issues you're trying to deal with, and you're probably looking for a particular product with certain benefits to address those issues. And those benefits could be safety, improved performance, retaining investments, cost savings, or environmental issues like sound or drainage or splashback. So based on the needs you have, uh, each one of the TOPS products has been assigned certain benefits to help make it easier for you to decide. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to you, Shri. 
as the moderator. All right, thank you very much, Tim. Um, the first topic uh, today is going to be high performance in overlay. Uh, and the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna have a presentation from one of our team members uh, before uh, there will be a presentation from New Jersey DOT on this. So our team member who's gonna present is Karen Moran Raj, uh, who is a project manager at the TransTech Group. Uh, he received his master's degree from Arizona State University and is a registered professional engineer in California, Minnesota, and Texas. Uh, he's been doing this for a long time. For over 15 years, he's been worked extensively in both the design and construction uh, of pavements and paving materials. Uh, and, and specifically in California and Texas, he has a lot of experience uh, with, uh, with these type of overlay mixtures and uh, working directly uh, on site with the uh, state DOTs uh, on both the construction and preservation side. So uh, Kieran, take, that, take it over, please. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction and greetings to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, presenting the very first product of the asphalt overlays as part of uh, EDC6 TOPS program. Um, and this presentation basically is going to give the, the uh, goal of this presentation is to give you an overview, uh, including some of the history and benefits of high performance and overlays. And then if you're an agency trying to consider this uh, uh, for implementation, uh, what are the considerations that you would need to give during the design and the planning stage? Uh, we're going to look at some of those things. And then uh, as well as if you're a contractor trying to um, provide a, a, an excellent product to your customers, what kind of uh, things you need to be aware of during the production and construction stage of the project? Uh, and we're going to look at some of, uh, some of those aspects as well. And uh, one, one of the things that we noticed while we were doing research on this product was that contractors as well as state DOT um, personnel um, call high performance thin overlays uh, uh, as hepto as well. So uh, you're gonna see that myself and the next presenter are gonna use this uh, interchangeably. So uh, the thin overlays have been around um, for a while now, we know that uh, People have been using uh, thin overlays for quite a few decades um, in across the United States as well as in the world. So what makes high performance thin overlay a different product from the regular thin overlays? And you'll notice that it's the performance requirements, performance test requirements that have been included in the specifications that uh, makes these overlays uh, really high performance, truly high performance. So HEPTO is generally um, it's a fine aggregate mixture with polymer modified asphalt in it. And in, in this presentation, you're gonna see basically two states. We've, we've studied two states that use um, um, thin overlays that qualify as high performance thin overlays. And uh, one of them is New Jersey and the other is uh, Texas. And New Jersey calls their product as HEPTO uh, while Texas is, uh, Texas's version is called um, um, TOM, which stands for Thin Overlay Mixtures. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at these products, you really want to know and understand how the product came about and how it evolved over the years. So we looked at the background and the history, and basically what we found was this was like a story of two states, Texas and New Jersey. And one agency basically took an experimental mixture that was used in a parking lot for, a, uh, for an auto dealership and they wanted a very thin lift overlay, but, but also it, it was supposed to be heavy duty to, to withstand a lot of traffic. Um, and, and that's how it came to being in New Jersey. While in Texas, it was slightly different where um, there, there was a, a, a quarry that had a lot of good quality aggregate and these uh, uh, fine aggregates were scalped and uh, the engineers there tried to figure out how do we make use of this good quality aggregate um, and, and uh, get all the benefits out of it um, and trying to be sustainable as well as not wasteful. And that's how uh, Tom evolved in Texas. And uh, basically the result of these two research projects there in New Jersey and Texas was a, a high performing durable surface post mixture, which can be used in pavement preservation or uh, in multiple ways that you're gonna see here in this presentation. So the potential benefits of HEPTO basically are um, pretty much in sync with the TOPS program. Some of the uh, uh, 
benefits that Tim Ashenberger talked about um, when he talked about, uh, when he was introducing EDC6 tops to you, um, they're in line with the benefits that you get out of Hepto as well. And Hepto can be used as a multi-purpose uh, multi tool by both state agencies and local agencies as well as contractors. Um, some of the things that you'll see and notice is that uh, the benefits could be similar to that of a thin overlay, but uh, one of the mission of EDC6 Tops is to extend your pavement life, and Hepto has been very um, successful in doing so, which you're going to see uh, or uh, hear from the next presenter. Um, also, one of the things is that uh, you have to take these benefits on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, for example, the right quality improvement. Um, it is kind of subjective because it's a thin overlay mixture. You cannot expect the right quality to be improved solely by applying HEPTO. So there, are, there is some additional work that needs to be done if you have to really leave all the benefits that are shown on this slide. Um, so yeah, the main thing is not to forget that um, the treatment has to be at the right time on the, at the right location. Next slide, please. So now that we looked at the background and benefits and history of HEPTO, let's take a quick look at uh, the consideration one needs to give during the design and planning stage of uh, a high performance thin overlay application. So the project selection criteria, uh, it really depends on uh, the agency. If you're a state agency, you might have a criteria or if you're a local agency, you might have some, something else that you might be looking at. So again, following the EDC6 TOPS team, um, you have to look at your high priority and your high need, where do you need this really? And uh, agencies um, typically see um, uh, the roadways that have a lot of high traffic, they cannot afford uh, long closures and they cannot be intervening too many times. Uh, such, such roadways are good candidates. However, uh, when you're picking them as a candidate, you also have to look at the timing of it. And that's where your pavement evaluation comes into play. And um, um, basically the uh, application needs to be timed such that your pavement is still in a good condition. And there are several uh, indices that you can use to identify if your pavement is in a good condition or fair condition or poor or uh, any index categories uh, such as surface uh, distress index or a structural curvature index that um, are out there um, that are standard, uh, typically used by your agency can be used. Also, um, an important thing one must consider is the pre-overlay repairs. So prior to applying HEPTO, uh, one needs to repair any kind of existing uh, distress that one might see. And uh, a rule of thumb, agency rule of thumb may be used, rules of thumb such as, you know, not more than 10% repairs or 15% repairs and such. Um, may be applicable here as well. And uh, um, uh, what you're seeing on the photo here in the photograph here are some poor candidates. So it's, sometimes it's easier to show where not to use HEPTO rather than where to use HEPTO. And you can see that in the pictures here uh, taken by TechStar, uh, there are some uh, heavily distressed pavements and uh, where you have alligator tracking, you have to fix that first, either by a full depth repair prior to applying um, HEPTO. And lastly, uh, not lastly, but uh, the cost and benefit ratio, this, these are some of the things that you need to look at. You have to, again, EDC6 is looking at a cost-effective solution. So there is no LCCA present at this point for HEPTO, but there's always a first. So if um, any of the audience is gonna perform an LCCA on HEPTO for their projects, um, it'll be interesting to see where it stands. Um, and some other considerations such as environmental or application, uh, uh, urban areas, um, HEPTO could be suitable, and that is another thing that one needs to consider during the design and planning stage. Next slide, please. So now looking at the materials and mixtures, so this is where you understand how HEPTO works and how it looks, and you can see there's a side-by-side -side comparison of the gradation, and we're going to talk about it in a second here, but um, the first thing you need for your high-performance thin overlay mixture is your aggregates, so make sure that any material that's used in this product is a good quality product or a good quality material because this is gonna be on your surface. This is your best mix and your, you know, it's, it's, it's important from an aesthetic standpoint, everybody's gonna be looking at your surface mixture. So 
uh, make sure the aggregates are crushed aggregates, good quality aggregates, and the binder is a polymer modified asphalt binder. And it's ideal to source it locally, try to promote sustainability here. Um, so again, another theme that EDC6 follows. Um, in terms of recycled materials, it's uh, suggested that recycled material not be used and can be used in somewhere else in your pavement structure, but not for your surface mixture. Um, some of the common additives that we're seeing to be used in uh, HEPTO is a warm mix additive or a liquid, uh, liquid antiscript to um, address any kind of moisture susceptibility issues uh, that there might be for the mixture. In terms of mixture design, again, this is a local agency or the agency preference in terms of what the mixture design has followed um, locally so that uh, it doesn't, that there are no conflicts in terms of, uh, and, and the ease of implementation is uh, help with uh, using um, a known design procedure. Um, and you're gonna see that in terms of specifications on the next slide where, um, there's a snapshot of the specifications because of limited time, we're not able to go too deep into the specifications, but here you can see um, like a highlight of the difference between uh, specifications, part of the specifications uh, included by two agencies, uh, pretty much standard mixed design requirements, um, similar to those of other HMA products. However, the most important thing to notice here, and we cannot emphasize enough is that the performance requirements for the mixture, that is the most important thing. Um, and also you can notice that uh, the agencies, uh, that the performance test itself can be an agency preference. As long as the agency and the contractors um, are comfortable with the performance test, um, that can be adopted. And also uh, something you can see that they, um, these are finer mixtures, therefore, you know, it has high asphalt content. And you can see, um, if you recall from the previous slide, that the tech start uh, gradation was slightly um, coarser than that of, uh, and there's a typo there, it should be a Tom C and not a Tom F. Um, the, the text art gradation is slightly coarser, so it takes a little uh, less asphalt than this one. But again, the most important thing here is the performance requirements. Next slide, please. Now coming to the production and construction practices uh, and, and uh, what needs to be um, kept in mind. Again, uh, in any thin overlay mixture, some of the things that uh, you have to keep in mind are similar to that for HEPTO as well. Our same same um, standards need to be practiced. The materials need to be uh, free of contaminants and uh, general standard care during production um, is uh, required. Um, one of the things one must uh, think about is that this is a very fine mixture. So when you're producing it in the plant, uh, you might have just two bins or three bins if you're uh, uh, using additional aggregates. Um, however, plant balance is something that your plant operators must be uh, aware of while using this. Um, in terms of surface preparation, you have to clean your surface. However, the important thing here would be a tack coat application. So a good tack tap coat application, uh, trying to inspect it. And also uh, if there are any... Uh, um, including requirements for a bond strength of your overlay is going to see you're, you're going to see that your pavement life is extended further. Uh, also the uh, you can see that there's a shuttle buggy or a material transfer vehicle on the picture that's being shown right now during uh, construction that's important to make sure your thin overlay is not losing temperature and you're achieving the compaction and the density um, to provide the to reap the benefits of your high performance thin overlay. Um, during the research of this product, another thing that we were made aware of uh, by the contractors is that test strips, test strips before construction really help them out a lot to understand their mixture and how it behaves under the roller as well as during placement. So um, if you're looking for some success using Hepto, you're going to uh, just stay tuned. Um, Robert Blight from New Jersey DOT is going to present his case studies. And also there are some uh, publications that are going to be coming through ADC6 talks program, um, which talk more about high performance than overlays. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen, um, very much. That was, uh, thank you for the great introduction to HEPTO. Uh, and next we're gonna talk about uh, New Jersey DOT and Robert Blight from New Jersey DOT is gonna 
um, talk about his experience with Hepto in New Jersey. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just a little bit of background about Robert. Uh, Robert is the executive manager of the payment and drainage management and technology unit at New Jersey DOT. Uh, he, re he received his bachelor's in civil engineering from Rutgers in New Jersey and has been working at New Jersey DOT for over 25 years in payment engineering, payment management, materials, geotechnical engineering, construction, uh, pretty much uh, name it. And uh, Robert has done that for New Jersey DOT. So uh, we're really uh, glad to have Robert presenting New Jersey DOT's perspective on HEPTO and uh, why they think HEPTO is a great uh, tool in their tool belt uh, for uh, payment reservation and overlays. Uh, Robert? Thanks, Shree. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert Blade. I'm going to present a little bit on HEP HEPTO, which is High Performance Thin Overlay. Next slide, please. So why do we use High Performance Thin Overlays in New Jersey? Number one, we have very extremely high traffic, um, heavy traffic, heavy truck traffic. We have extreme climatic conditions up in the Northeast, which a lot of my Northeast partners are well aware of. Uh, we also have a lot of older infrastructure that's crumbling that we're trying to hold together. Um, so high performance thin overlays and tools like this in our toolbox are absolutely necessary uh, to extend the life of our payments as best we can. Next slide, please. So what is high performance thin overlay? Well, we use it as a preservation mixture. Um, you know, our preservation program has ramped up over the past several years. Uh, it's a one inch thick uh, overlay. Um, with a nominal maximum aggregate size material, 3 8 maximum, uh, polymer modified asphalt binder. Uh, it has a modified superpave volumetric design requirement. And then uh, the modification is we have uh, performance tests, APA rut test requirement and Texas crack overlay test requirement. Next slide, please. So, our high performance thin overlay has to meet these performance requirements in the Texas overlay crack tester. We require a minimum of 600 uh, or more cycles uh, before cracking occurs in the overlay tester. In the APA rut, uh, we require the material to not rut more than four millimeters in the APA rut. Next slide, please. So this is our process. Uh, that we go through when a job is awarded. There's a mixture design process that's uh, similar to most mixtures, but with the added uh, test strips and performance requirements. So the supplier is required to do a volumetric super paid mix design. Once that passes, it goes to verifying that the performance test requirements are met. If it passes that, goes on to the next test strip. Uh, section. If it fails, it goes back to volumetric mix design and a redesign of the mixture to get past the performance testing and the volumetrics. Once you go to test strip, again, the material has to be run through the plant and a test strip done and performance testing verifying that, uh, that you know, the performance tests are met as well as the volumetrics and the test strip. Uh, once we go to production, um, you know, you, you got another test strip on site and then during production samples are taking, taken for quality control and quality acceptance. Um, the performance tests are done again during production at a certain interval. And if the material is not meeting, then a pay adjustment is made to that material. Next slide, please. So. Uh, the pay adjustment part of it. During production, we allow up to a maximum of five millimeters of rutting. Right now, I have that circled in this chart because we may be making a revision to the specification in the future to drop that back down to four uh, millimeters. But as you can see from the chart, if you go above five millimeters of rutting in the APA rut and you're between five and 12 millimeters of rutting, there's a, a sliding scale pay adjustment. Once you get beyond 12 millimeters, it's remove and replace or 100% no pay for the material. And then the overlay tester, again, 600 minimum cycles in the overlay tester. Um, if it doesn't meet that and it's somewhere between 600 and 400, there's a pay adjustment. 
Um, if it's below 400, then it's 100% no pay or removal and replacement of the material. Next slide, please. So this is our first HEPTO project. It was placed in 2008 on Interstate 295 northbound in Salem and Gloucester counties. It's a very heavily traveled route uh, with 60,000 vehicles per day. Um, there's a high amount of truck traffic out here. So it's about 76 million uh, 20 year equivalent single axle loads. The existing pavement before placement of the HEPTO was an existing four inch thick super pave HMA. Uh, that was paved in the year 2000 over a 10 inch thick jointed reinforced concrete pavement. Um, as you can see from the photograph, there was some reflective cracking, a little bit of patching here and there at the joints, uh, but overall it was in decent shape. Uh, it had a surface distress index in 2007 before placement of the HEPTO of 3.4. Now surface distress index in New Jersey is measured on a scale from zero to five. And it takes into account all the surface distress. A five is a perfect pavement in brand new condition and a zero is a completely failed pavement. So this was a 3.4. Um, it was on the good to fair side of our surface distress. The international roughness index or smoothness of the pavement was about a 90 inch per mile, which isn't so bad. It's a good, fairly good condition and uh, worthy of preservation. Next slide, please. So in 2008, we opted to do a one inch thick hepto over top of this pavement. Um, we milled in at the edges of the lane uh, to meet the existing grades uh, just beyond the rumble strips. After placement, we had a perfectly new pavement. Uh, surface stress index was considered a five for new pavement. The IRI, as you can see after placement was exactly the same as before at a 90 inch per mile. Um, the reason is because we hadn't put an IRI requirement in the contract documents on this project. So the contractor had no incentive to do better than what was the existing ride quality. Um, in 2019, we reviewed the, P the uh, payment management data and uh, saw that the surface stress index had degraded to a four. So it was still in very good condition after 11 years of heavy traffic the IRI had remained unchanged. So 11 years, still in good condition. We did a second preservation treatment over this pavement, applying an ultra thin friction course, which is essentially a ultra thin bonded overlay. Um, next slide, please. The next project I wanna talk about is Interstate 287 in Middlesex County. Again, very heavily traveled roadway, 150,000 vehicles per day. Uh, with 20 year equivalent single axle loadings of higher than 50 million. The existing pavement was a five inch thick super pave HMA that was paved in 2008 over a 10 inch thick jointed reinforced concrete pavement. Um, in 2015, before placing the HEPTO, the surface distress was a 3.4. Again, it was in that good to fair range condition of the pavement. The IRI wasn't as great. It was a 124 inches per mile. Next slide, please. So in this particular contract, a, a uh, IRI requirement was put in the contract. Um, and so as you can see here, uh, after placement of the high performance thin overlay, um, the IRI requirement you know, yielded a 39% improvement at 76 inches per mile after placement of one inch thick hepto. Surface stress index, brand new pavement, a five. Um, on this particular project as well, there was some reflective cracking that uh, was and longitudinal joints that were open in between lanes that was filled in with uh, type two microsurfacing before placement of the HEPTO. Um, in 2021, after reviewing the uh, pavement management data, surface distress again is a 4.3, so it's still in good condition. And the IRI is essentially the same at 79 inches per mile. Um, so after six years of heavy traffic, still in good condition. We're hoping, uh, you know, in a few years to preserve this pavement again. Next slide, please. So as you can see, we've used a bit of hepto over the years. Um, you know, we have we have found that it's applicable to all types of roadways. However, we reserve the use of it predominantly to high traffic roadways and uh, freeways and interstates. 
Uh, however, we have used it on lower volume roads as well, but um, you know, we reserve it for mostly the high traffic roadways. Uh, we've had significant use, 30 plus projects, um, 1500 lane miles placed in New Jersey. And of all those projects, what we found is that we're getting significant life extension. Uh, compared to our mill two pave two, we get about eight years average on system wide on our mill two pave twos of standard HMA. With the Hepto, we see that we're at about 12 plus years of life extension compared to the eight years of mill two pave two. So as you can see, for us, it seems to be worth the investment. Next slide, please. So some of the things that we've learned and the challenges uh, as Kieran had covered, pre-overlay repairs are important. Um, if the pavement has full depth repairs required, potholes, things like that, patches should be done. Um, again, you have to think that this is a preservation mixture for us, so we're not doing too many pavements that are in really poor condition. We're, we're looking to preserve good and fair pavements that have little repair work, but they should be done uh, because that's going to reflect through it. And, and that goes for micro milling or milling as well. If you have to meet the existing grades and you have to mill, we require micro milling in New Jersey. Uh, our micro milling has a four millimeter maximum texture depth requirement, which is checked uh, you know, by our construction folks. So uh, we highly recommend that the quality of the milling is a micro mill. Otherwise that mill texture, if it's too rough and there's the texture's too deep, it'll reflect through the one inch thick overlay. The high performance thin overlay mix design is absolutely critical. Um, that should be done with the utmost quality and materials. Um, it, it, it's gonna pay dividends up in the end when you use good materials up front to do your mix design and balance it. As Kieran said earlier, um, production should be balanced. So you, you should have different stockpiles so you can make adjustments uh, to your material as needed through production. Production quality control is absolutely critical as well. Um, if quality control measures aren't followed, uh, you know, we've seen some issues with the material during production. The test strip, absolutely critical. It, it is to simulate the conditions on the project during production. And so when you do your test strip, your test strip should be representative of, of the conditions that are you're going to experience during production. It establishes the roller pattern and it gives you the opportunity to correlate your thin lift nuclear density gauge with the field cores in the test strip to make sure that you know, your roller pattern is sufficient and it's dialed in. And when you go to production, as you can see, um, you know, that, that should be followed. Next slide, please. So some of the other challenges and lessons learned, weather limitations. Um, this is a thin material. Uh, if, if you've played around with the software, uh, pave cool. You can see the thick, how the thickness and temperature affect the material. This is only going down one inch thick. So the base temperature has to be above 50 degrees. Um, we have a 50 degree minimum temperature requirement for base temperature in our specification. The pavement should be dry, no moisture, no precipitation. Um, we have seen some blistering on some projects and uh, that is due to moisture left on the pavement. Um, or within the milling, uh, whatever the case may be, good quality control, good dry surface in good condition, good temperatures are a must. Um, the surface should be clean and dry. One of the things we require is a vacuum sweeper. It, it should be enforced that, that that surface is cleaned properly prior to placement. Next slide, please. Again, proper quality control during pavement. Um, proper use of the thin lift nuclear density gauge. There has to be an adjustment usually for your QC people because they're used to measuring densities with the nuke gauge on a thicker material. For the one inch, if it's not done properly, they might be getting uh, densities below this material. So it's only one inch thick. That adjustment has to be made with the, the thin lift nuke density gauge to make sure they're getting the density of the right material. Following the roller patterns, again, you establish it during the test strip, you follow it during production. If something changes, a new test strip should be done or adjustments need to be made so that we're still getting quality compaction, quality smoothness. 
eliminate the use of diesels or other distillates for cleaning paving equipment during production. Um, we've seen this reflect right through a thin overlay and uh, it, it really ruins a good product. So um, this is something that should be strictly enforced. And again, dialing in your paving operations so that you have the proper number of trucks to supply the paver and the material transfer vehicle and everything is running at a consistent, continuous, smooth, steady pace throughout production uh, with very little stops and starts. This is going to result in a much better product at the end of the project. Next slide, please. So what could go wrong? The photo on the left was a project in New Jersey uh, where the contractor supplier did a test trip. They thought they had it dialed in during production. I don't know what went wrong, but they didn't follow their roller patterns. Um, and they ended up having to, they overcompacted the material after it had been cooled off and in doing so had debonded it from the layer below. Um, and so when the traffic hit this within a couple of months, you could see the shoving and the movement of the hepto material in the wheel path on this slight curve in the left photograph. When we went and did a forensic investigation, you, it was clear to see that the material was moving and it wasn't bonded well in these locations. Um, and you know, this is this is what can go wrong if things aren't done properly, properly, and proper quality control measures followed. On the left or on the right hand side, uh, another project. What had happened here is uh, there was miles of interstate paved with hepto uh, during production. It wasn't realized at the time, but a leak in the drum mixer with the diesel fuel had gotten into the mixture and got into the, the lanes on the project. Uh, within two years, we had uh, significant rutting and shoving for about two miles on the project. Um, and as you can see from the cores taken, the core on the, the left side, uh, it, that was the, the, the shoving, the humped up hepto material outside the wheel path, just outside on the skip line. In the center, the core in the center was the wheel path. Essentially, all the hepto had been moved out of the wheel path and to the outside of the wheel path because of this uh, diesel contamination in the mixture. In, and the core on the right side, um, that was the center of the lane and it, the hepto thickness had essentially remained unchanged in the center of the lane. Very interesting, but you know, contamination of diesel, a big problem um, on these types of materials that should be watched and strictly enforced. You know, to, and it just so happened that in the APA rut testing during production, this phenomenon was picked up in the APA, APA rut. We had about 10 or 12 millimeters of rutting. However, the materials inspection staff at the time weren't sure they they weren't as familiar with the testing they they thought maybe hey maybe our test is wrong let's leave it in place and see what happens well this is what happened so the test was right the material was bad and that's one thing we learned so that's what can go wrong sometimes next slide please what can go right um, in 2020 the new jersey asphalt paving association awards awarded the interstate 287 northbound hepto project uh, they had paved hepto on this heavily traveled interstate and the resultant project was a 47% improvement in the international roughness index. So, and, and this seems to be the case on many of our projects that we get a great improvement in IRI and uh, a great product out of this. Next slide, please. So what we found over the years of using this as one of our tools in our toolbox is that Hepto works very well for New Jersey. Uh, we've significantly increased our good payments and have made a significant decrease in our poor payments. So we're very happy with this material and this product. Next slide, please. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Some really good information on the couple of projects that you talked about and some of the do's and don'ts. Um, there are a few questions, but we'll wait to um, address those questions at the end of the webinar to, just to make sure uh, the other presenters have enough time for their presentation. Uh, I also wanted to mention to the participants, 
uh, as part of the everyday six uh, targeted overlay payment solutions uh, uh, effort uh, with federal highway uh, there are several documents that are being prepared uh, on hepto uh, there are some case study uh, reports and on new jersey dot's hepto specifically uh, and a how to document on uh, hepto as well uh, these are in the in various stages of the production uh, and uh, and uh, approval stages and uh, so uh, look out for these as they uh, are released by federal highway in the future um, next slide please so the next portion of the presentation is going to be on crack attenuating mixtures uh, and again as we did with hepto uh, a member of our team uh, will be presenting some background information uh, and that will be amanda jillyland uh, from who's a project manager also at the transtech group and uh, she received her master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Utah and is a registered professional engineer in Alaska and Texas. Uh, Amanda has a lot of experience with um, all kinds of asphalt projects and with over 12 years experience, she worked as a quality control manager in a heavy civil contracting company uh, and specializing in payment construction in Alaska, remote Alaska, if you will. Uh, her expertise includes mixed design, asphalt construction, aggregate protection, and intelligence construction technology. So she's been doing a lot of this for a long time and uh, talking about her experiences on this uh, for a while. And once she is done with her presentation, uh, uh, we will have a presentation uh, with uh, 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 based on Texas DOT's experience with uh, with the uh, crack attenuating mixtures, and I'll introduce uh, that presentation in a little bit. So, Amanda, take it away, please. Thank you, Shree. Uh, next slide, please. So, I just want to give some background information and kind of some general overview of the crack attenuating mixture um, in preparation for our next uh, case study, which is TextDot's experience using this product. Um, so the crack attenuating mixture or CAM is actually typically used as an interlayer. So if this isn't a surface mix uh, necessarily, it's more of an interlayer um, that is paired with a surface mix. And you know, as the name suggests, the idea is to prevent reflective cracking um, in your overlay. Um, there, the CAM mix has a pretty fine gradation, so a nominal maximum aggregate size, typically between a number four or three eighths inch sieve. Um, there's typically a pretty high asphalt content. Um, so I have on here typically around seven. Um, it may be a little more, a little less, but kind of averages around seven. Um, and then the other key characteristic is of course the performance testing. So very similar to the HEPTO performance testing, um, it's performance tested for crack mitigation resistance and for rut resistance. And I'll um, describe those tests in the, the next few slides. Um, it also uses polymer modified asphalt and high quality aggregates. Um, TextDot does not use wrap in these mixes. So um, these are virgin mixes. Um, and you can kind of see these are sounding very similar to the hepto mixes. Um, there are a lot of similarities in these kind of high performance mixes. Um, so I'll, I'll highlight some of those uh, similarities and then also some of the unique differences with CAM. And before we move on, I did want to mention there are a few other uh, CAM terminologies out there. So different states are also using um, uh, crack attenuating products um, and they may call them something a little differently. So here's a few examples on here. Um, so for example, New Jersey DOT has something similar, but they call it the brick, which is the binder rich intermediate course. Uh, Nevada DOT has been doing some CAM products, but they call theirs the engineered stress relief course. Um, and then there's some other terms um, that maybe are used as well um, in the industry or in research. So crack relief interlayer, fracture tolerant, shear resistant, you know, anything like that, um, maybe a, a very similar product. Next slide, please. And so just a little bit of uh, the background uh, at TextDot. Um, the original CAM mix design was inspired by a, uh, another product 
This product was a proprietary crack relief inner layer product that came out in the 1990s. And TechStot was doing some research on it and found that it was indeed quite crack resistant, um, but it didn't have a very good rut resistance. So because it's an inner layer, a lot of the research TechStot was doing kind of revealed that, you know, as an interlayer, the rut resistance wasn't necessarily an issue as long as that surface mix, you know, was about, you know, two to three inches in depth. And as long as there wasn't any staged, you know, staged construction that was going to open traffic on the cam interlayer. So unfortunately, that's not very realistic. Um, as you know, everybody knows, you know, when you're constructing new new uh, overlays or, you know, you have a couple different overlays or lifts happening. Uh, it's very difficult to do it all at once and not have some sort of, you know, staged construction pattern. And so it was kind of, you know, not having any rut resistance wasn't very reasonable um, for TechStot at the time. So TechStot started to look at their own product that used, you know, local material sources and had the crack resistance, but also had that rut resistance. Around the same time, in another district, uh, there was another sort of uh, issue at the time um, where there was a, a large stockpile of a really high quality fine aggregate piles. So what was happening is contractors were creating, you know, a coarse aggregate product using really high quality aggregate and the screenings left over um, weren't necessarily being used in these mixes. And so they had quite a surplus of these high quality fine aggregate piles. Um, and so, you know, they went to uh, Texas A&M Transportation Institute and said, hey, you know, what can we do with these high quality fine aggregate piles? Um, and so the TOM or the thin overlay mixture, uh, which Kieran introduced earlier in this webinar um, was developed. And so you had the CAM product being developed and the TOM product being developed. And it turns out they were actually very, very similar. So they both were a uh, you know, finer product. They were both being performance tested. They both had the crack and rut resistance properties. And so what happened um, is TechStock kind of realized, hey, these products are very similar. Let's kind of merge them into one and just move forward um, with one product. So some districts still prefer to call this crack attenuating mixture CAM. So the CAM specification still exists at TechStot. Some districts still use it and call it that. Other districts are using um, a Tom F or a Tom Fine product as their CAM product. So um, you can see here, I've plotted the Tom F and CAM broadband gradations on this 45 power curve. You can see they're almost identical. Uh, there's a couple slight changes in there, but you can see it's a pretty fine graded mix. Um, and the CAM F or CAM or Tom, I'm sorry, the Tom F or Tom Fine is very similar to the CAM. Now to take this one step further, um, as Karen introduced, there's also a Tom C product at TechStot. Um, so still called thin overlay mix, but it's designated as coarse with the letter C and that gradation is a little bit coarser. Um, but the Tom C product pairs very well with Tom F. Um, so you'll see um, when Ashwak gives her presentation, um, Houston districts typically using a Tom F interlayer with a Tom C surface course. Uh, next slide, please. And so you can see here kind of the difference between the CAM interlayer product, which is shown on the bottom of this image, and then the Tom C, which is, of course, the coarser product as the surface lift. So you can kind of just see. Um, the difference in the, the gradation of uh, void structure. Now the surface course is very important when you're designing a CAM interlayer. Um, some of TechStot's research and other DOT's research as well has found that even when you have this, you know, crack resistant inter interlayer, 
if you're not pairing it with the right surface mix, you can actually have the cracks kind of jump through that interlayer and still show up in the surface. And so the surface mix that you pair with the cam is very important. Um, so I mentioned Textot has found um, that the Tom C, which also of course has some crack attenuating properties, um, tends to pair very well with the cam mixes. Um, other DOTs have found success with you know, SMA mixes. Um, I believe New Jersey DOT has found some good success using a Hepto on a, their brick cam product. Um, and so the idea here is just to make sure you're not putting a very stiff surface mix on top of your you know, very flexible cam interlayer to avoid this kind of crack jumping phenomenon. Another really important thing to consider uh, designing and planning these products um, is just to make sure, of course, that there's a really good um, bond mechanism. So really good tack coat or um, kind of sealing layer that goes on um, with this mix, um, which I think Ashwalk's going to talk about in her case study as well. And similar to the Hepto, it's important um, these products are um, placed in thin lifts. So uh, in terms of you know, project selection, um, really significant structural distresses need to be repaired um, before a cam interlayer and overlay. Uh, next slide, please. So here's some more of the mixed properties. Um, this table shows both the CAM specification as well as the TOM F specification. So just to recap, um, very similar products um, and a lot of the text districts are actually using the TOM F as a CAM product. So you can kind of see they're very similar. Um, and of course, the highlight on here is the performance testing requirements. So you can see the CAM requirement um, for the overlay tester uh, has to reach 750 cycles before failure. Now the standard TOM specification um, shows 300 cycles to failure. Um, however, a lot of the districts will, you know, increase that number in a special provision if it's being used as a CAM interlayer. Uh, so for example, uh, the Houston di district has found that using the TOM F specification with a higher requirement for the overlay tester makes a very good CAM product. And you can see, of course, that there's also some rut resistance uh, requirements in here as well. So TechStot uses the Homburg wheel tracking test. And so you can see um, that again, these, uh, these mixes also have some rut resistance as well. Next slide, please. And so just to talk a little bit more about the performance testing, um, this is the overlay tester. So this is the test that TechStot uses um, for resistance to reflective cracking. So you have a specimen here that is glued onto these plates. And one of the plates is fixed um, and the other plate, uh, there's a force applied to it. And so the idea here is you want to be able to complete the test with a certain number of cycles before you see the failure. So again, for the CAM specification, that number is 750 cycles. Um, and for the TOM F, um, you know, you may have a different number in there depending on um, experience and kind of what works. But right now, the Houston district is typically looking at 500 for that. Next slide, please. And then for rut resistance, TechStot uses the Homburg wheel tracking test. Um, so you can see here, there are some uh, samples here. So there's the wheel that goes over these samples uh, so many times, and then you have to have uh, a minimal rut depth um, by time the test is complete. And so you can see here um, in the picture, you have some CAM samples as well as some surface TOM samples next to it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so that's all I have. So Shri, I will let you introduce the tech stock case study. All right, well, thank you very much, Amanda. That was a great introduction to Cam and to Tom. Uh, to talk about tech stock, uh, we have Ashwak Muhammad 
uh, who is a project manager in the Textot Houston district. Um, she has 16 years of field construction experience, including four years with Textot. Uh, and she has worked on several construction and maintenance projects. Uh, she has a lot of experience with Denova Lay Mixtures and Tom projects. And like I mentioned before, she has been a project manager on some of these projects. So I'm glad to have Ashwak uh, present uh, on behalf of Texas DOT in today's webinar. Ashwak. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. And I'm here today on behalf of Beata Coulter. Uh, she's the one that she had the presentation, but for she couldn't make it today. Uh, next slide. Okay, we will talk. The outline of the presentation today is taking four sections: the background and how we uh, end up using uh, the thin overlay mixtures, tons, and why in Houston, and what's what we need to pay attention during the construction and design, and the summary. Next slide, please. Uh, thin overlay mix, Tom. Uh, has been the first developed in Austin district back early in uh, 2000s. And it's became a standard specification in 2014 and known as item three, uh, 347. Since then had been used in a variety of pavement projects uh, throughout the Houston district and some other districts as well. Next slide, please. Uh, in Houston, uh, we found that, uh, next slide, please. Uh, first used in Houston in 2014 uh, in US 59, I-69. Uh, uh, the, the, the road itself is made of uh, concrete and we decided to go for overlay the project. The total length of the project is seven miles and it's between uh, I Interstate uh, Highway 16 to Beltway 8. And that uh, highway is one of the busiest uh, US highways in Houston and it has a 300,000 ADT. Uh, we needed a mix that uh, durable, uh, crack resistant and can go over the concrete pavement. And at that time, the reconstruction of the road is not an option due to the, uh, because it's a busy road and the conventional asphalt overlay was not an optimal choice. Next slide, please. So Tom Scullion from Texas A&M TTI Research Institute, he introduced us to uh, that new uh, mix, Tom's, and he helped develop all details requirements for testing and construction execution. The end result uh, and the design for that uh, mix was using a seal coat as a base. And the seal coat basically is uh, um, like an oil or a binder and aggregate. And then we come with one inch of cam or Tom F as a level up and for a crack sealing. And then we end up with one inch of Tom C for surface and that with a trackless coat in between the two uh, layers of Tom's. The project successfully constructed and it's currently last for more than seven years now and it's still in good condition and no cracks. Next slide, please. And this uh, picture here shows the road before the construction and it shows like the concrete and all the repair that had been done to the concrete before start the, the asphalt. The next slide will show the, the project after and it's still in good condition and no cracks. Next slide, please. The conventional dense graded HMA overlay, uh, we had uh, several issues discovered over time and the specification for the regular asphalt, which is item 340 and item 3421, allowed for use of recycled materials, wrap and rust. The low asphalt content in this uh, next design, after a few years, we had the stiff road and the furniture cracks, and overall the expensive of keep replacing asphalt was expensive. So we had to find another mixed design. Next slide, please. When we used Tom, uh, the, pa the pavement preservation, we found the several benefits in Houston district, uh, equal or better performance than any other mixed design, long-term resistance to rotting and cracking, uh, sound reduction restores and improves the ride quality and restore, uh, restores and improves the skid resistance and overall cost benefits. The next slide. Uh, since 2014, uh, we constructed several projects using TOM mixes, and we use it on both base, concrete and asphalt. 
Uh, Houston has a high traffic uh, uh, highways and more than 80,000 ADT uh, with over than 10% trucks, as well as stop and go traffic conditions. Roads. Tom's offer us a new alternative uh, to minimize the future maintenance cost and improve the longe uh, longevity. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the good thing first and the important thing about using uh, Tom is to evaluate the pavement uh, condition uh, and make sure it's a good candidate to use a Tom, uh, uh, the Tom mix. The thin, the thin surface application is not ideal for uh, pavement required extensive rehabilitation or structural improvement, which means if we have a lot of cracks in that road and it's filled, the structure or the base is filled, so Tom is not a good mix to use on that. Uh, it's performed crack sealing, uh, spot base repair in highly distressed area on concrete and full depth repair. So we use a full depth repair on the concrete and make sure it's all repaired before we lay the asphalt and the start the uh, construction operation. Uh, we use seal coat as a base, the first base in overlay pavement, uh, where surface cracks are not wider than 3 8 inch and areas of rotting less than half an inch. Next, next slide, please. Talking about the moisture, because we cannot lay the asphalt on top of moisture. So in one of our biggest projects here in Houston, the contractor decided to use uh, these two machines that you see. The one to the right, it has an air jet, and that's where he blow uh, just air on the surface to dry up the surface. And the second one to the left is a heat bar. So those two are used usually in the horse race and uh, where they need to dry up the, the soil. So he used the same method to dry up the road and it works very good. Uh, but that like if you have just a less moisture, but not uh, after like a heavy rain or something, but like it's just a, sh a little bit of rain or just a little moisture on the surface, those works very well. Next slide please. So the surface must be clean and dry before the placement. Uh, dirt or dust is not good because that will cause bonding issues. And it's not uh, good to place tom after rain when surface is saturated with moisture. Um, the, tom, uh, the tom mixture should always be placed, uh, produced with a temperature more than 300 uh, Fahrenheit and placed at temperature or 70 because it's cooled down very quickly. The seal and bond is very important for the thin overlay uh, uh, to prevent the moisture infiltration and the failure. Uh, we use the seal coat of A-R or TR before placing tom F, which is CAM, and the interlayer with tom C. So in between of, the, between of them, we use the seal coat. And that's its bonding, uh, waterproof, and seals uh, small cracks. Next slide, please. And that's like you know, a closer look for, for the two machines that have been used. Um, again, this one to the right is the heat bar, and that one to the left is the uh, air jet. Next slide, please. Uh, the compaction. Uh, use, uh, use of double steel wheel rollers working uh, in tandem is recommended, and pneumatic tire roller will have excessive asphalt uh, pickup. Tom's uh, mixture uh, cools quickly and it's difficult to compact one temperature uh, loose uh, once the temperature cools down. Uh, Textile uh, water flow test recommended to ensure density and uh, impermeability, and that's uh, for for both layers, for both like Tom C and Tom M. And we used uh, regular asphalt in areas where roller is unable to work. So because Tom. Tom mix cools very quickly. So in a certain area like the turn lanes or uh, smaller driveways, we, we use a different mix type of asphalt. We didn't use Tom at all because it's need to, uh, in those small areas, we need a, a, a hand work. And Tom mix is not good when you use, when you have a hand work. So you have to use an alternative mix design in that small or small areas that you have. Also, uh, make sure like to train field inspectors on execution of terms and to provide construction guidelines to ensure the quality. Next slide, please. 
these two pictures from a project has been done. The one to the left shows like the existing layer here is uh, asphalt. And then we have the layer Tom F or CAM. And then we have Tom C, that's the surface. And the one to the right, it shows like uh, the use of the steel wheeler and the pavement behind. And that's for the final layer, the Tom C. Next layer, please. Uh, the one to the uh, the picture to the right shows the final look for the project after it's completed. Uh, if you see the different in color, so the the darker color that's the new asphalt, and the the lighter color, which is the gray, that's a concrete. So in this area, we started uh, the concrete and asphalt. Next slide, please. The summary uh, overall. The thin overlay mixture tombs has been used on, on a variety of pavement projects uh, in textile district. Uh, it's less expensive than conventional mix and it's long life uh, span and more durable and crack resistance because of the, of the mix of the two layers that we are using and it's uh, better overall performance. And that's it. All right, well, thank you very much Ashwak. That was a uh, really interesting uh, again, as uh, as I mentioned with the uh, HEPTO, um, we are developing additional documents for CAM, uh, including some how-to documents and some case study reports. So those are, will be available from Federal Highway over the next several months once they go through the uh, publication process. Um, a special thanks to Ashwak again, who stepped in at the very last minute. Uh, we had a different presenter, Beata, who actually uh, a quarter, Biata Quarter, who actually prepared the presentation, and Ashwa stepped in in the very last minute because Biata could not make it today uh, at the presentation. So, really special thanks uh, to Ashwa for pinch hitting for Biata at the very last minute. Um, we do have some questions. If you want to go to the next slide, I believe it's just for Q and A. Again, if anybody has any questions for any of the uh, webinar presenters, uh, please type that in the chat session. Uh, we do have some questions, so I'm going to quickly go through them in the order that I um, received them. Uh, the, uh, the first question or more of a comment is from Wala who says, uh, it's critical to define the thickness um, and uh, in terms of the overlays. And I know specifically with the presentation we did today, uh, the presenters did talk about the thickness of the overlays uh, and tops itself covers a, a wide range of overlays. Um, so I guess this, uh, this question is a little bit broad and I don't know if Tim, you want to answer that question or, uh, uh, and I know that if, uh, um, if Robert or Amanda or Ashwab want to chime in in terms of the thickens. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in here. This is Robert Blight. Um, so for our hepto, you know, we, we typically design that at one inch thick. Um, we have gone to about an inch and a half, but uh, don't recommend really going beyond that because it's such a fine graded mix. Uh, we believe that, you know, rutting may play a, a larger effect as you increase the thickness of that lift. So what we do is we try and limit uh, the lift thickness, you know, to typically one inch, but maybe up to an inch and a half. If you have to put in more material, uh, the suggestion is to do it in multiple lifts of about one to an inch to an inch and a half. All right, thank you, Robert. And, and Walla in general, uh, in terms of your question, I think each of the uh, overlay types will have their own um, criteria. And I recommend you attend the remaining webinars. <laughs> uh, here in want to learn Houston. about those. Uh, here in Houston, for those uh, the thickness, so for Tom F, we don't go more than one inch or come, and for Tom C, we don't go for more than one and a half inches. And if we need it for any reason to um, correct the elevation of the road, we use uh, an alternative. So in one of my projects, uh, we used uh, type D as a level up to get to the level that we need, and then we end up with Tom C and Tom F. It's not recommended because the higher you go, it became more um, like a brittle or something. Thank you, Ashwak. Tim, I see you unmuted yourself. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, no, nothing to add. I think uh, Robert and uh, 
Eshwak answered that question well, and thanks for sending in the question, Walla. Um, I also got a question from Amber, um, and uh, she asked if we can receive a copy of the slides or the recording. Um, the Federal Highway goal is to post a, a link to the webinar uh, on the website. It, it will have to go through the publication process, so there will be a recording. Uh, in terms of the slide, I think we are planning to send that to the participants, but we'll need to check and make sure that is appropriate. So um, we will try to provide the slides to the participants. Um, Jesus Sandoval said, where can I find more detailed guidelines regarding process uh, project selection criteria? Um, one of the things I did want to mention is under this contract, we are developing some materials, how to documents and things like that, uh, for which also include the project selection criteria. Uh, but Robert um, and Ashwak, did you want to um, add to any project selection criteria you had uh, in terms of HEPTO or Tom? Sure. Um, one of the things that we're looking at with HEPTO is preserving good pavements. Um, so we have limits, you know, as far as how much cracking and rutting and uh, how smooth the, the road, is, the existing roadway is. Um, you know, if the pavement, if considering all those things, if we consider the pavement is in poor condition based on those indices, we may not uh, choose to do a preservation with HEPTO on those. But uh, yeah, we're, we're in the process of developing um, our own documentation, uh, a New Jersey DOT pavement design manual as well. And we'll be assisting uh, with the EDC6 TOPS efforts uh, to help Shri and his team uh, have documents available for the selection criteria that we use for HEPTO. Ashwak, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, Robert uh, answered very well. He covered everything. Thank you, Robert. And yeah, Shri? Right. Yes, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, it would uh, let Jesus know that as part of our EDC effort of uh, promoting implementation within states, we do have some uh, technical assistance we offer. So uh, Jesus in Arizona there, if you are interested in using one of these and want to get a little bit more detail while we're getting these documents published, we can uh, reach out and provide some kind of one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to help you out to see if that's a good fit. And you just contact me and we can uh, take a look at that. Great point, Tim. Um, a question for Robert uh, from Kang Wan Lee. Um, how did you choose asphalt binder 64E? And his question says, what does E stand for? So while we were developing the specification for HEPTO, um, we, uh, worked in conjunction with Rutgers Asphalt Lab in New Jersey. Um, Rutgers University has an asphalt lab there where they can do all kinds of testing. Uh, Tom Bennett heads up that lab. Um, he had sampled materials from some of the, uh, the main suppliers in the north, central, and south part of New Jersey, and he had done some work in the lab there uh, using their materials, their aggregates, and using a standard polymer modified asphalt binder. Uh, basically the 64E is a polymer modified asphalt binder in New Jersey. It used to be when we had the PG grading system, a PG 76 minus 22. Um, so PG 64E is just using the new massacre test, but it's essentially a similar binder to the, the PG 76 minus 22. Um, and what he found when he was developed doing the, the, the laboratory work for the HEPTO is that um, essentially most suppliers could produce a HEPTO mix using the 64E or 76 minus 22 binder. Now, that doesn't mean that every producer can use that binder. Some may have to use uh, one with a little bump in polymer, uh, which we consider a port 76 which the Port Authority uses on some of their polymer modified projects, uh, which has a little bit more polymer in it to help resist the rutting and the cracking. So every supplier is different. And although we don't 
we don't specify typically the 64E. It really, we have language in the specification that essentially says that the 64E may work. However, it has to pass the performance overlay crack test and the APA rut test. So that the it's a com incumbent upon the supplier to work with the binder supplier with their aggregates to get a mixture that uh, meets not only the, the volumetrics, but the performance testing. Thank you, Robert. Um, there's actually two more questions from you, Maybe from for you. Three. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, just to supplement Robert's answer just briefly. Uh, so the standard PG grading, of course, is the, the super paved performance grading is AASHTO M320. But then as Robert mentioned with the massacre, that's AASHTO M332. And then in there, they have the gradings of S is standard, H is high, V is very high, and E, I think, is extreme. So Correct. Okay. So that's all. I just, just a brief addition. But Thanks, right. Tim. Yeah, thank you, Tim and Robert. Um, Robert, as I mentioned, there's a couple of questions from Michael Samuelov. Um, the first question is, does New Jersey DOT allow wrap in this mix, or is it 100% virgin mix? Uh, what tag code is being used and is New Jersey DOT providing oversight guidance uh, in terms of uh, tag code performance? Um, well, number one, we don't allow wrap. Uh, it's a 100% virgin mixture. Um, and that's what we found is uh, when we allow suppliers to introduce wrap, um, the quality control of how much wrap is going at the, at the plant isn't watched close enough to ensure that the mixture is gonna to continue to meet during production. So we went with, because this is just a one inch thick, it's very critical to get high quality materials. We're, we're not allowing wrap, it's a virgin mixture. Uh, the tack coat is our standard uh, emulsified asphalt tack coat. Um, our tack coat specification allows a couple different types of standard tack coat uh, in New Jersey. Um, I can, get you the information on that. We have used uh, CRS-1P, which is polymer modified when we have placed Hepto with a spray paver. So, um, you know, we've used unmodified emulsified tack coat and uh, polymer modified emulsified tack coat with a spray paver. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, oversight, uh, that's, that's always an issue in construction. Uh, making sure that the tack coat is uh, proper, if it, it it's the right material, um, it's applied properly. Uh, we go through training every winter with our construction inspection teams uh, about, you know, making sure that they're getting samples of the tack coat on the job and sending it to the lab for testing and also ensuring that the surface is clean before tack placement. And then when the tack is placed, it's placed uh you know, consistently and uh, at the right application rate during production. Um, so uh, although, you know, these, these measures are in place, you know, oversight is a very difficult thing uh, to ensure that, that the contractor is following specifications. Um, it, it's, it's a constant battle. All right, thank you, Robert. Uh, there's a couple of comments I'm gonna read um, just so that everybody um, may who may not have read, read it on the uh, on the chat board. Uh, Mario Jar says, only as a comment in Argentina, we have extensive experience using 06 sand asphalt with 9% of soft polymer modified binder and no more than 1.5 centimeters of thickness. Um, Greg Lyons also has a comment, <coughs> says Texas DOD has used glass pave with a Tom wearing coast uh, glass pave has a higher tensile, um, which is 50 kilonewtons per meter and it's very thin, so it installs well. So those are just a couple of comments. Uh, there is another question, and this one is actually uh, for either Ashwag or for Amanda, and that has to do with uh, uh, the testing requirement. And Mario, um, again, said, bearing in mind that the max thickness of CAM is around two centimeters, is it representative and necessary uh, to carry out the Hamburg wheel track testing where samples are five centimeters? Uh, 
Amanda or Ashwak, do you have any thoughts or comments on that, uh, on the Hamburg testing? Well, on those tests, like, I, I'm sorry, I cannot answer these questions because it's most likely it's for the lab. So it should be like from uh, a, lab, uh, a lab technician. Okay. I apologize, but I can, um, whoever is the, the, like, you know, the question is, they can email me the, the question and I, I would be more than happy to answer, check for him and I will answer that question. Okay, sounds good. And Shri, I it's just might chime in, but uh, but yeah, I know the uh, cams an inner layer, but there have been there are a lot of cases out there where you can put a leveling course or an inner layer down there, and it can end up being a weak layer. So when when you put that down, you do want to make sure <coughs> it's rut resistant. I think it's just a uh, oddity that the thickness on the pavement is less than the thickness in the the test, but you do have to go through some type of rut testing to make sure it is rut re resistance. You don't want to build a, a weak layer down there that's going to be, well, relatively close to the surface. Thank you, Tim, for the clarification. Um, there is another comment from Gary Fitz, uh, who says Oklahoma DOT often uses a 1.5 inch thickness when specifying their rich intermediate layer, which is essentially the same as Textot's CAM mixture, but uses their Heimer binder specification, which is a PG76-28. Uh, um, Randy Lamar asks, um, this is, I think this may be the last question. Is there a PCI range for good measure um, use of HIPTO? Not really clear what that means. So. I believe he's talking about pavement condition index and in New Jersey, we're, we're not using PCI, but we're using SDI surface distress index. Um, and, you know, for us, uh, uh, we're looking at targeting, targeting probably above a three, five, a 3.5 for SDI. Uh, we use SDI zero to five, uh, five being a new zero being a completely failed we find that uh, when our SDI drops below 2.5, that we schedule those payments for resurfacing typically. Uh, above 2.5 to 3.5 is generally considered fair condition with regard to SDI. And from 3.5 to five is considered good condition uh, with regard to SDI in New Jersey. Um, so, so we're typically targeting payments <laughs> Uh, for preservation that are fair to good. So they may be, you know, right around three, five, or they may be a little bit below or even above. So that's, that's typically what we're doing in New Jersey. All right. Thank you. Um, there is an, I guess we have time for one more question before we probably end this uh, webinar. Uh, Ibrahim asks, may you elaborate what is the impact of the type of surface mix that Hepto and Camp will be applied to? Hepto is a surface mix, Ibra, so I'm not sure that this question applies to Hepto. Uh, but in terms of CAM, uh, I don't know if uh, Ashwak, you want to answer this. Uh, do you, uh, are there any other types of surface mixes you use with the, um, with the intermediate layer, um, SMA or other types of surface mixes that you use? Uh, no, we usually use Tom C. Tom C and Tom F, because as Amanda specified, they worked very well and they worked very good as far as crack resisting, rotting and everything. Using other materials could be temporary, but not like for long term because you will end up with the cracks, with, with rotting. Um, so that's the recommendation that, what, that we have and that's what works very well. And we've been using this since uh, 2014. All right, thank you, Ashwak. I, I believe it's about time to wrap the webinar. I have a couple of slides. Um, next slide, please. So <clears throat> thank you everyone for uh, the presenters for presenting in today's webinar, really great job um, describing your experiences with Hepto and Cam and Tom. Uh, thank you all the participants for attending today's webinar and for all your questions. And uh, we'll definitely we'll learn a lot from uh, the questions that uh, you have asked. Uh, there's eight webinars in this series, so please uh, um, uh, 
look at your email and we'll be advertising these. Well, our goal is to have about one webinar every month. The next one on concrete overlays is going to be in January. And so we're trying to have uh, the, the dates are, some of these are not scheduled yet, but uh, expect to have one of these every month. Uh, and then the third webinar will be on stone matrix asphalt and HIMA and, uh, and then alternating with concrete. Uh, and then webinar five will be ultra thin bonded wearing course and open graded friction course. And um, webinar seven on asphalt will be asphalt rubber gap graded and enhanced friction overlay. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, four, six, and eight will be on various concrete overlays. So, um, <clears throat> so that's the uh, webinar. And I believe that's our last slide. Um, please remember to sign up for EDC6 News um, and Innovator. If you haven't done so, you'll get a lot of uh, uh, links and information uh, when you sign for this, uh, you can go to uh, fhwa.dot.gov innovation in order to sign up. Again, thank you everyone for attending the webinar, and really, it's been my pleasure to uh, moderate this webinar. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.